teaches political science at the University of Illinois at Urbana. He's the author of many books, including Political Tolerance, Balancing Community with Diversity, and The Politics of Empowerment. He's currently working on a book about public opinion that is called Flattering Leviathan, Public Opinion and the American Welfare State. An intriguing title, if you ask me. Professor Weisberg spent his early life in Manhattan, but he decamped with his parents to New Jersey in one of the original uh, white flight movements. And so from an early age, he's been well aware of certain kinds of uh, population dynamics. And today, he will speak to us uh, on the relationship between blacks and Jews. Please welcome Professor Weisberg. <laughs> Well done. You can make a career out of this. Uh, well, thank you. Let me uh, begin this by giving some preliminary uh, remarks. One is, is I think I may have written a paper finally that will offend everybody. Um, over the years, I've been accused of being offensive by my left uh, liberal colleagues. I, I am obviously kind of loath in the department. Uh, uh, graduate students, when they walk past, uh, avert their eyes and look down at, uh, rather than look at me. And uh, when I walk into the room, everybody sort of walks to the other side. Um, I have been denounced by name in the Chicago Tribune uh, for my racial views. Uh, uh, fortunately, they didn't get the addresses correct for my children and their social security numbers. They, they, they had a couple mistakes there. I've been routinely denounced uh, for my views by the campus newspaper, the Daily Illini. I've had delegations and, and protestations against me face to face in my office. Um, so uh, I have had perhaps uh, not quite yet been burnt at the stake, um, but I've had uh, uh, lots of hateful email and threats and things like that. So I, I would like to establish to begin with um, my bona fides as a persecuted victim, a person who's been oppressed, et cetera, et cetera. I guess we all are today. Okay, um, and I think <clears throat> Jared has hinted uh, rather well what my views are, and unlike my colleagues, I have uh, uh, published these views openly with my name on it. I have eventually, uh, I hope, an article coming out in Chronicles. It was supposed to be out in February, then in March and then in April. All of us who've published in Chronicles, I think, know the story, uh, what happens. Uh, it's like the Roach Motel. Uh, articles go in, they don't come out. Um, so uh, I have published uh, in, um, in very inflammatory articles on, on white racism. So okay, I say that because I suspect many of you, some of you here are going to be offended by what I say after this, okay? now. When Jared asked me to write the uh, article on blacks and Jews, being a good academic, I went to the library and I started uh, slaving over these things, dragging back home endless bags of books, articles, until they filled up an entire shelf. And most of these things on blacks and Jews, predictably, were written by Jews. How amazing. And uh, they, uh, most of it gave uh, duplicity and mendacity a bad name. Um, these things were basically apologies, um, uh, explanations, coloring schemes, giving, putting the best possible spin on loathsome behavior. And after a while, I said, and I, by the way, I will give you today a little bit of a remedial lesson in Yiddish from time to time. It's always good to be able to pop a few words in when you're accused of things. And I said to myself, genug is genug, which is actually the same in German, which means enough is enough, okay? So I put all these books aside and decided to write off the top of my, based upon my own experience. Um, figuring that nobody had been honest up to this point, and it was time for somebody to be reasonably honest about a, a variety of things. Now, paper really is about two things. <clears throat> One is the, um, 
the issue of blacks and Jews, which is actually not that complicated to, um, to understand. I grew up in a, as we say, a very diverse environment. I went to uh, Booker T. Washington Junior's uh, high school. I speak uh, fluent, Mofa, which is the Urbanics, ur okay, Middle High Urbanics, actually, if there's a linguist among us, okay. I am board certified fluent in it. I have translated, like Jared, I have translated at various trials. Uh, <laughs> it's not much of a living, but you, you can make a living doing what, what, what he mean, Your Honor, um, stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> And um, I was chased, as Jared said, we, we, we fled. It wasn't exactly the uh, Russian army we were fleeing across the Odonessa, but it was close enough for government work. Uh, so I know something about uh, the phenomena between uh, blacks and Jews. But the other thing I want to talk about, which is far more uh, sensitive and, and awkward, is uh, anti-Semitism among the right. And uh, this is rooted in a conviction of mine uh, that one of the items on the conservative agenda, and I do feel very much part of the conservative movement, is how do you get the Jews away from the left and on our side? Anybody who has uh, uh, traveled in the uh, uh, Jewish uh, political circles, and I have to a certain extent, uh, knows that there's something very powerful about the expression guilt by association. Um, that is that uh, Jews have a lot of brain power. They are very, very energetic. They have certainly a lot of money. And if they were on our side, not their side, it would make a huge difference for us. Uh, we talked about uh, what do we do to energize the movement yesterday. I thought it was an absolutely brilliant speech. But one of the questions we have is we have to pick off people who are over there and get them over here. Okay, and so this is not necessarily going to be a pleasant task. Okay, but let me begin. And by the way, this is not a system I like. If I stop periodically and read, normally I use a little microphone. Um, I lecture at the university. I've had classes as um, high as 1,500 students. Uh, I am oftentimes the great guru. Uh, they come and they bring me gifts and smart things. Uh, but this is a system I, I, I really, I, I really, we take this out? Okay. I, I'm not comfortable with this. Okay, let's, let's, let's begin. Uh, let's begin with a simple question. Uh, what, uh, um, what explains the historical infatuation between blacks and Jews? But before getting to that, I, I call this sort of a codependency uh, relationship. Uh, and then we will discuss, or I will talk about, uh, how we can separate this and then some of the problems of it. But let me begin by reading into the historical record as one might submit documents in a court trial. Um, two items. The first item is something we all know, which is the tremendous support Jews have given the black cause. And uh, it's really quite remarkable. At one point it was estimated that something between 20 and 40 percent of all black children in the uh, South during the, during the 20s and 30s were supported by Jewish generosity. The uh, Rosenthal, the, they not, uh, what is it here? The, the Rosenwald Foundation, Schiff Foundation, uh, were extremely generous in, in black education. All of us know <clears throat> that the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund was, was virtually bankrolled by Jews, and the lead lawyer, Jack Greenberg, obviously was Jewish. But if we bring it up to date, uh, many of the participants in the uh, Freedom uh, uh, Marches, in the demonstrations, were Jewish. It, many of the advisors to people like Martin Luther King, James Farmer, were Jewish. Uh, even today, Jews continue, despite the best efforts of ethnic cleansing, to play a, a very central role in black organizations. I, and I, and I, if any of you are interested, uh, I can certainly direct you. By the way, let me also, I forgot to say, I brought many extra copies of my, of my paper. I've been giving them out. Um, I'd be more than happy to 
send anybody a copy or email them as an attachment. When I wrote the paper, I tried to make these, in some cases, very controversial, very, uh, <clears throat> oh, how shall I put it, um, difficult arguments as finely etched, nuanced, and as qualified as possible. I, I do not like to write uh, things I cannot defend. So there's a lot of very legal-like documentation, a lot of very finely nuanced material here. And uh, maybe just, these are sliding off. I'm going to put this over here. Anybody who want to get a copy can, can, can go and you read it. Okay, so the first point I want to submit is the fact that Jews have, from time immemorial to the present, been the great friend of the black man. And I think among many Jews today, uh, support for civil rights uh, is second only to the support of Israel. Uh, why they do this, we'll get to this in a, in, in a bit. It's certainly not my view. Now, exhibit B in this uh, uh, <coughs> court case is wretched black anti-Semitism. Now, all of you know that it exists, but take my word, it is worse than you think. Um, uh, black anti-Semitism is not exactly something that uh, the mass media dwell on. It does come out. Um, but it has been documented over and over and over again. And what is uh, really amazing is how deeply it penetrates in among blacks. Uh, for example, uh, rap music. I'm sure all of you are familiar with my colleague, Professor Griff, and uh, Public Enemy. That's a, a, ra a rap joke. He's a, not a real professor. <laughs> he doesn't even have, well, actually, he probably does have tenure. That's unfortunate. Um, and these people, commonly uh, bash Jews uh, as, a, as a matter of, uh, of fact. What's also interesting, <clears throat> and this is perhaps more uh, depressing, is how popular this is among alleged black leaders. I know that's somewhat oxymoronic, but nevertheless, um, uh, this, is, this seems to be the, uh, not only is Louis Farrakhan, we all know that, but Jesse Jackson <clears throat> is well known for biting the very uh, Jaime town hand that feeds him. And uh, Ben Ginsberg, in a wonderful book uh, called The Fatal Embrace, makes the point, and this is a point that, that really should be underlined and kept in mind, that <clears throat> if you are a black leader and you are going to, ap to appeal to the bros in the hood, uh, there is nothing, nothing that outshines rabbit anti-Semitism as proving one's commitment and one, uh, to, the, to the brothers because anybody who bites the hand that feeds them is certainly a good race man. And so people like Jesse Jackson and many others have uh, made a career in their co competition for, for being the man, the black leader uh, in, the, in the ghetto by being uh, vile anti-Semites. Um, most of us are also familiar with the uh, version of this that goes on in the academy. Uh, people like Leonard Jeffries and many others who have made a career pointing out that blacks, that the Jews financed the slave trade. Uh, and surveys have indicated shock upon shock, I guess everybody has a chance to be shocked, that uh, anti-Semitism anti is more popular among educated blacks. <laughs> Um, you would think that uh, they would know not to bite the hand that has fed them for the years. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, there too, it seems to be a mark of one's uh, authenticity as a black to come out and, and denounce the gutter sniping uh, Jews. And of course, uh, fantasies about Jewish doctors in inoculating little black boys with AIDS, of course, is, is to be expected. I mean, that thing which but that, that's sort of obvious. Okay, I'm always reminded of the story uh, said about Gladstone. He was sitting in his club <clears throat> in London, and a man came to him and said, Mr. Gladstone, there's an individual going about London saying terrible things about you. Gladstone looked up and said, I don't understand it. I never once did the man a favor. <laughs> 
no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, now, let me quickly cover, I'm going to try, the, the lighting up here is just terrible, uh, cover the, uh, some of the traditional explanations of why Jews have this uh, affliction. We have many afflictions. Uh, uh, this certainly is one of them. Uh, and I'll just go through almost as a catalog of why it has been said among scholars that Jews continue to um, uh, um, uh, have an affection uh, towards blacks, okay? Those who want a ex uh, religious explanation can go to the Torah. There's a concept in Judaism called Rachmonos, which means compassion, pity. Uh, it, it is a central idea. Um, uh, in Judaism, that one, ha one da is a good Jew by showing compassion and pity, and absolutely, uh, who is better to show this to than long-suffering African Americans? I mean, if you wanted to get a person, a, a group that you know would be a lifetime of availability for this, uh, blacks would certainly, you would say, it's be guaranteed. I mean, you would never have to worry about losing that, say, gee, you know, that was fine. Uh, you know, it's like not having, like supporting a charity that's going to cure the disease, then you're going to have to find a new charity or something like that. You know, this is obviously something that you can rest assured, okay, that uh, it would be permanent, okay? Um, there's also the argument that Jews have had a long historical um, association with the central state. Any of you who know uh, European history will know that in many cases the relationship was between the Jews and the monarch. Uh, the Jews believed in a strong central state because only the strong central state could protect them. And Jews exchanged economic vitality. They, they, they made the place rich. The king, meanwhile, protected them for against the local notables. And today, the incarnation of that is the, uh, <coughs> I have a hard time even saying it, you know, the New Deal, Great Society, the Nanny State, the bureaucratic colossus, this, this loathsome creature that, that is run by, uh, um, you know, the social, work, uh, social workers with an agenda. And um, Jews have always been part of that. Um, and uh, you can make the argument that uh, uh, this uh, is a kind of client um, relationship they have. They, they love this kind of thing. And once again, <coughs> Blacks make the uh, perfect state client. Uh, I mean, they go, for, it's, it's womb to tomb, uh, from program to program, uh, from transition to transition. Uh, they, they never leave it. And if you are going to have a central state uh, that, that takes care of a client, uh, blacks are the perfect client. Um, there's also the kinship of suffering hypothesis, which is particularly among early uh, immigrants in the United States. I, I used to hear my grandparents talk a little bit about this, you know, that blacks were like Jews. They're kind of like us. You know, they come, they have nothing, they have, uh, they're discriminated against, and so you have a kind of, they're sort of like a, a, a distant cousin or something like that. You feel, you feel sympathy for them. And then you have more modern, modern, uh, um, uh, versions of that, that is, uh, the advancement of the civil rights cause can be a way of creating a kind of white bread, multicultural society in which Jews who, who are self-loathing can, can lose their identities in some sort of uh, giant um, uh, homogenized kind of society. Anyhow, there are as probably as many of these explanations as, as, as there are books on the subject. Now, all of them, to certain people, contain a degree of truth. I mean, uh, there are Jews out there who feel a genuine compassion for suffering people, and uh, in some ways that's very commendable. There are also Jew Jews social service providers who sort of like the idea of blacks as a permanent justification for their own jobs. And there are those people who like the civil rights movement as a kind of movement that they can use to destroy uh, the society which uh, uh, stigmatizes them. And, and you can go on and do all kinds of psychoanalytical uh, um, uh, treatments of that. Now, uh, however, however, um, as the Soviets used to say, uh, objective conditions have changed, uh, or to continue, the correlation of forces is, is, is quite different than what it, what, what it used to be. There is no question 
that anybody who looks out over the political landscape today will see that Jews and blacks occupy antithetical positions in, in politics. I mean, clearly, uh, it's become zero sum. It, there is no longer, uh, save perhaps the uh, uh, blacks as permanent bureaucratic clients, any justification for Jews supporting uh, the black cause. Uh, clearly, affirmative action has been harmful for Jews. Jews uh, initially were the great exponents of merit-based society. Jews, and actually uh, much more so Asians, have been hurt by uh, affirmative action in, hi in higher education. By the way, if any of you want to know how, just how bad affirmative action is in higher education, I'd be more than happy to tell you stories that even you would not believe. Uh, it really is bad. Um, now, uh, but more importantly, um, the uh, black assault on Jewish life. I mean, if you looked around on our cultural landscape and you tried to find two groups that have different values, that, 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 that venerate different things, that worship at different altars, uh, it is hard to find two groups as different as blacks and Jews. I mean, Jews cherish education. Uh, they, they, they're obsessed with it. Um, uh, blacks, on the other hand, you know, destroy it. Uh, anybody who's gone to schools in the inner city know that not only do they hate the idea of learning, but they physically destroy the schools and, and assault their teachers, okay? <laughs> and um, uh, the, uh, go on forever on this point. Uh, I grew up in, I always like to say that this is the, uh, I went to schools, I'm stealing now from Rodney Dangerfield, where I, you know, Booker T. Washington Junior High School, where they uh, searched you for knives and guns. If you didn't have one, they gave you one. Um, <laughs> I, in my own experience, I, I, I invented many social policies. Some of you may know a policy called PL4, uh, 480, Food for Peace. Uh, I had one called Lunch for Peace. This was an early proto example of, of, uh, of government generosity to the third world. I had my own little Food for Peace program going when I was a student. Here, here's my lunch, take it, okay. <laughs> um, uh, it probably in the long run did me good, okay? Um, uh, black anti-intellectualism uh, is, is rampant. I mean, any of you who, who work in the academy and, and uh, had discussions with, with, with erstwhile black scholars on intellectual matters know that they, in many cases, I, I, not all, uh, in fact, one of my heroes is Tom Sowell, um, uh, know that uh, their, their appreciation for finely nuanced argument for the scientific method, for objectivity and all things like that, it, it is, about, is about zilch. Uh, if you look at uh, relationships, uh, it, when blacks move into a neighborhood, uh, the first people out are Jews. Um, Jews did not invent white flight, but we perfected it. Uh, we, we, we wrote the book on, on, on the subject. Certainly things like social uh, exchanges, intermarriages, and things like that, it's almost zero. Um, they, they, they just don't mix. I mean, it's just, uh, um, you go to, 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 to black neighborhoods, you know, high level, Jews do not are not into crime, maybe we economic crimes occasionally, eh, why not? Okay, but uh, the types of things that blacks specialize in, muggings, assaults, rapes, and things like that, are certainly not, not, a, not a Jewish predilection. Okay, now, let me now get into uh, some controversial areas, beginning with, um, uh, with something that uh, many of you kind of suspect but how Jews really relate to, to, to blacks, okay? This is something that Jews seldom, if ever, talk about except when they are among themselves. Um, and uh, I, I, I say this based upon my own observations and my many, many conversations with Jews. And uh, by the way, I, before I, I did this paper, I vetted it with a number of, of, of uh, my Jewish friends. And I said, tell me, is there anything 
here that you're going to say, that I'm saying here, which is wrong. And they said one in particular. I won't mention his name, but he has been a speaker at this conference. Said, you, you know, it's worse than even that. Okay, it's worse than that. Okay. Um, now, I will I will lapse in here to get the proper emotive uh, flavor. I will I will uh, lapse into a little bit of Yiddish from 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 uh, time to time. Now. <sighs> When, black, when, when Jews get together in a safe environment and they begin to talk about blacks, if they are really are forthright and honest, they will use the term schwarze. This is a term that uh, today is extremely politically incorrect, um, needless to say, but it is still being used. Uh, it has not died out. In fact, it's almost a badge of one's commitment to, to, to the cause among Jews to, to, to use this, this term. And I want to go through here and explain to you what Jews really mean uh, when they talk about Schwarze. Now, if you go to Leo Rosten's Joys of Yiddish, uh, he is very careful in what he says. I mean, he's, his entries for many, many words are very rich in meaning and, and they run for pages with lots of examples. But he suddenly becomes very tight-lipped when it comes to Schwarze. He says simply, a black person, a Negro, okay, a person of color, something like that. Uh, my friend, that does not begin to uh, depict what the term Schwarze means for uh, among, among Jews. Now, the first thing we should say is it is not necessarily a negative word. Um, it is not the same thing as nigger. In fact, if a bunch of elderly Jews were sitting around, as is their want to discuss the Schwarze, by the way, when I was growing up, this was a great to topic of enormous fascination and concern among my parents and grandparents. They could talk about it forever. But if you had inserted the word nigger as to receive some kind of lexiconic variety, people would be genuinely offended. I mean, it is not a slur term. It is not a derogatory term. In fact, sometimes there may be even a degree of affection in it, you know, like, ah, oh, you know, I heard, I heard Mrs. Schwartz got a new Schwartz. Ah, oh, how nice, how nice. Okay. Uh, so that's the first thing, okay? Um, the, um, uh, the second thing, uh, uh, so, so the first thing is that it's not a derogatory term, okay? The, the second thing is, is that when you use the term Schwarze, it always, always implies cognitive inferiority. Uh, the mental picture of, of, of a stupid black in, in, in embedded in the term Schwarze is true even for pro-civil rights Jews. I've had many discussions with liberals, uh, Jewish liberals on this point, and uh, you know, after about 15 minutes, you can begin to get down to, to, to serious things. And I say to them, tell me, you know, you really think this is going to help, you know, all these laws, all these uh, affirmative action policies and things like that? And you say, look, at, they're Schwarze, what are we gonna do, you know? And we have to do something for them. They can't do it on their own. You know, it, it, it is it is um, um, in it is integral to that term. Okay, uh, adding a phrase "dumb Schwarze" is somewhat superfluous, reserved only for the most egregious stupidity. Um, invisible baggage likewise includes gullibility, emotional excitability, and a weakness for here and now conspicuous consumption. Violence, especially interpersonal alcohol-induced mayhem, is also associated with Schwarze. In other words, if the image that comes to the mind of Jews when you say the word Schwarze is, you know, a, a rather simple-minded, uh, impulsive, um, easily uh, um, uh, seduced by, by trinket kind of thing. Uh, and the, um, uh, this, some of you will realize is extremely close to the traditional southern image of blacks. 
In fact, I would argue that it's almost identical to, to what most, many Southerners would privately say, well, that's what they think about when they think about blacks. Now, this is a fundamental fact of life. It is no different than two plus two equals four. And it is routinely, or was certainly in the case of my generation, reinforced by daily experience. Uh, when I was growing up, for example, I went to integrated public schools. Those of you here from New York, uh, PS 75 on 96th Street and West End Avenue, PS 93 on 93rd and, and Amsterdam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this was daily confirmed in, in existence. Um, we had a procession of cleaning ladies. Uh, I think uh, when I was growing up, I honestly believed for a few years that all black people came from something called the agency. Uh, that uh, is actually kind of almost a religious thing, an agency, this kind of a, okay, that, that, you know, we'd hire black cleaning ladies and inevitably they, they'd steal and drink the liquor. Uh, and my mother would come back and say, I'm calling up the agency and getting another. Uh, uh, children came from uh, Macy's or Gimbel's, we were told, uh, but black people came from the agency. Only when I was about 27, 28 did I learn otherwise that <laughs> uh, where, 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 they, where, where they came from. But uh, very few uh, Jewish people of my generation uh, uh, had any other kind of contact. I mean, we had a procession of handymen and, and um, come to our house cleaning people and, and, and in school and whatever else we saw. And that, that, that deeply uh, ingrained that image. And so only later on, when we were stupid adolescents, did we begin to have fantasies to the contrary. But for the first uh, 15, 16 years of our life, uh, our parents' uh, comments about uh, blacks uh, fitted very well with our personal experience. And I would, I would argue that for even, uh, and this is important later on, even uh, uh, Jews who are pro-black uh, carry around with them that, that more basic underlying uh, uh, view, okay? Now, uh, third, and this is, uh, this is crucial, uh, it was always believed that any Jew can ultimately outsmart any Schwarze, save being confronted with a demented gu uh, gunman. Despite immense cultural chasms, uh, Jews held themselves innately capable of finessing blacks, thanks to their finessing blacks, thanks to the superior wits, verbal talent, and a mastery of black psychology. The unmatched success of Jewish ghetto merchants and ironically Jewish civil rights activists and leadership positions proclaim this truth. Even today, Jews may secretly brag about their success in beguiling blacks in contentious interpersonal relationships. Uh, people sometimes ask me, what did you do when they showed up as a demonstration, a delegation to your office? This happened to me one time. A bunch of angry young blacks came to my office. I said, I just relied on the wisdom of my ancestors. You know, I gave them a little bit of rope-a-dope, moved around, said this, said that. Within a half hour, they were, they were fine. <laughs> Many of them, I sold one a suit, several, several, <laughs> several new jewelry. OK. <laughs> they were happy. <laughs> You got a deal from Mr. Weisberg, you said, you got a guy. Okay. Um, where personal manipulation might fail, the storehouse of survival tactics uh, uh, sufficed exceedingly well. Black pathologies were bearable, especially since most black mayhem was self-inflicted. Jews might even profit from these, these disorders as merchants or nanny state therapists. Threatened Jews can flee deteriorating neighborhoods, enroll their children in private schools, hire security guards, co-opt black leaders financially or otherwise escape. These adjustments are hardly cause free, but they can be born and are culturally acceptable. Jews see no conflict between righteously defending black criminals as political prisoners and living in fortress style buildings. Jews permanently at risk from black disorders are rare. Uh, you have to understand 
that we have been managing things like this for 2,000 years, if not longer. Um, we are excellent at adapting to deplorable situations. It's part of our culture. We take a, a kind of almost perverse pride in it. I mean, Jews have lived all over the world under not very, less than ideal conditions, as they would say, and it's become part of our cultural baggage. Now, um, there's an irony here. Uh, on the one hand, Jews dread blacks physically. This cannot be un overestimated. Uh, underestimated. The, the, um, when Jews see blacks walking down the street, they, these are, they're feeling tremendous fear. I mean, there must be some kind of, we'll have Mr. Rushton explain this next time, uh, some kind of gene here that just says, Ugh! they really Fear. That's why they run away as, as, uh, as quickly as possible. Yet, they dutifully pay, pay the Dane Gelt. You know what the Dane gets, the extortion money. Though unquestionably they realize this only emboldens the Dane. By the way, a wonderful expression you should incorporate in your vocabularies is, uh, when you pay the Dane Gelt, the Dane never goes away. Um, okay. Now, they also simultaneously realize that black disorders are surmountable. Now. Um, now to get to some more controversy, okay? Ultimately, public affirmations aside, for most Jews, it is the goyim, non-Jews, Gentiles, a technically white goyim, since uh, um, Schwarzer, like the Chinese, are never categorized as goyim, uh, pose the greatest threat. Um, let me continue here and read this. Um, um, trust me, contrary fact-based arguments fall on deaf ears. Forget that Richard Nixon steadfastly helped Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Ditto for the gushy kindness publicly showered on Israel by Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, and other fundamentalist luminaries. By the way, I should add that I uh, fairly regularly watch uh, uh, the uh, Pat Robertson's news program. I find it actually one of the best news programs on television, and I really enjoy watching it. And um, uh, he is amazingly gushy towards Israel. In fact, uh, it, it, it's unbelievable. I feel embarrassed sometimes. I feel like I'm about to be asked for a donation because it brings, <laughs> it reminds me, it brings up, uh, you know, he's, I feel like he's just about to turn to me and say, okay, now I've said all that, you know, where's the check? Uh, years and years and years of attending fundraisers have conditioned me. Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the yearly brotherhood dinners in which earnest reformed rabbis and enlightened Episcopal ministers appeal for mutual understanding and tolerance are immaterial. Disregard everything else, no matter how assuring. Deep down, Al Sharpton or Steve Coakley, Steve Coakley was the uh, Chicago mayoral aide who was going around telling people that Jewish doctors were injecting black babies with AIDS, are judged less dangerous than Gary Bauer. Little Gary. Okay. Um, and uh, why should you ask? It's obvious. Historically, Jews have long experienced erstwhile friends who took great des uh, delight in genocide. The 2,000 year old sorrowful tale is, I would argue, indelibly etched into every Jew's subconscious. Okay. This is our baggage. Uh, centuries will pass before this fear evaporates. Call it paranoia, if you will, but it occurs over and over. It is the very essence of our history. Um, uh, there's a joke that's told among Jews. Uh, what are the three singular characteristics of, of, of Jewish life? One, uh, they will try to kill us. Two, they will fail. And three, we will have something to eat and discuss it. Um, <laughs> Uh, take my word for it, friend, there is more to that than just a bit of humor. Um, obviously, uh, World War II events and uh, uh, the slaughter under Marxism, even when Jews occupied uh, positions of leadership, um, are, are, um, are remembered. Uh, at least in my generation, and certainly my grandfather's generation, uh, grandparents, 
Um, even those who worshipped FDR, and my grandmother used to talk about FDR putting food on the table during the Depression, and if FDR said jump, um, they would jump, and they wouldn't come down until, until he had, Eleanor had given the okay. Um, they remember that uh, FDR turned back thousands of Jewish refugees seeking uh, asylum in the United States. Uh, I have personally, on repeated occasions, heard this, quote, good goy turns bad goy narrative repeated from those who barely escaped with their lives. Uh, the ostensible exemplatory goy metamorphosing into opportunistic gauleiter comes with mother's milk. And um, this is something that um, I, I, I try to get across. Uh, one of the uh, themes that occurs among Jews when they uh, um, get together, particularly I am of an extraction. I am my um, grandfather came from Austro-Hungarian -Hung Empire, and we still grew up thinking about the good Kaiser. Uh, not Willy the Zweite, um, and uh, he was a good loyal subject of, of, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. My mother came from Poland, and so we were Eastern European Jews. And among Eastern European Jews, there was a kind of contempt for the German Jews, uh, the Allemange. And um, it was always said, you see, they tried to assimilate, they spoke German, they were lawyers, they were doctors, they served in the army. Uh, Albert Ballin single-handedly built the uh, 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 Hamburg American line. They were, the Kaiser would come to their, uh, to their shuls. And by the way, uh, any of you want to see how really bad this is, visit Temple Emanuel on 63rd Street and uh, Fifth Avenue in New York. I took my girlfriend there, who is German, born and raised in Germany, and she said, my God, she said, this is a German church. Uh, that's Temple Emmanuel. And uh, the, uh, she said, I know, I know, I know, I know. I said, I'm a member. Uh, I order only. <laughs> so uh, the, um, uh, and Eastern European Jews would say, you see, they tried, they tried. They were the friend of the Kaiser. They, 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 they invented poison gas during World War I. They did all these things. They wore their iron crosses to the concentration camps. True. It didn't help. Okay? And so the, the, the same thing happened in Budapest and Hungary, okay? and many other places as well, where Jews were highly assimilated, and it didn't do any good. Their neighbors turned on them. And, th and that is something that is passed on to, in our baggage. Okay? I'm not trying to justify it. I'm not trying to, 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 to celebrate it. I'm just telling you, as they say, I'm telling you like it is. Okay. Now, uh, in this um, cabinet of loathsome curiosities, um, what about the Schwarze? Certainly, Al Sharpton is worse than Gary Bauer. Uh, certainly, the thugs in Crown Heights are, are, are worse than uh, the fundamentalist. Uh, certainly, if one were looking around for, for people about to do in the Jews, why do we worry about the white Christians? Why not concentrate on where the real enemy is, the blacks? Are they not also potential Cossacks or Iron Guards? Here's the punchline. <clears throat> they are incapable of such well-organized horror unless directed by nefarious whites. Yes, they can briefly terror terrorize Crown Heights, chase Jewish teachers out of Ocean Hill, Brownsville, or even torch Freddy's fashion Martin Harlem. A full-scale program is far beyond their capacity, however. Uh, Anti-Semitic outrage or episodes, not enduring campaigns. Can you imagine blacks systematically rounding up thousands of Jews or even keeping tabs on Jewish neighborhoods? This, too, would require a great society-like massive bureaucratic intervention program assisted by self-hating energetic Jews. As Karl von Clausewitz reminds us, assess enemies by capabilities, not intentions. If you multiply present-day anti-Semitism by potential for calamities, 
Correcting for escapability, the Schwarze pose minimal risk. They are too stupid. Um, and I give you the example, uh, a little history here. Uh, Freddy's Fashion Mart was a clothing store on 125th Street owned by, by, by a Jew. It was staffed entirely by blacks. Uh, it had a clientele of, of blacks and Hispanics. Uh, Rev the most reverend Al Sharpton had organized the demonstration against it for some time. He uh, eventually, one of his supporters came into the store with a gun. He eventually killed eight people. But the first person he shot was a Hindu lady, an Indian lady, and he believed her to be a Jew. Now, Jews come in many flavors, colors, and varieties, but I have never heard anybody say they come in that particular flavor. Uh, <laughs> and at least he could have, I mean, Tara, nobody should get shot. I'm not get, but, but anyhow, you know, that's the level of, 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 of stupidity. Okay, the key thing here is this. A slight bit of evil, a slight bit of evil in the hands of somebody who's very, very competent, okay, is far worse on a systematic basis than a totally depraved individual who's a moron. And that is the, uh, the punchline, okay? You multiply capacity by, um, by, um, by um, evil. Now, political homeland. Uh, why, and well, I think I'm running out of time here, having too much of a good time. Okay, why don't the Jews leave? Why don't they leave? They, why don't they simply say, enough already with the Schwarze, genug is genug. They don't leave for the very simple reason that there's no better place to go. If, uh, if, if a Jew who is angry with the present situation visited a dating service specializing in fresh ideological partners for politically abused racial liberal Jews in remission, disappointment awaits. The landscape of available others is very, very thin. Now, I will not go over this. I'm sh I, I strongly recommend you get this, but the bottom line is this. When Jews go wandering out for a new squeeze, any of you here who have been divorced know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, they go around shopping at the mall. Hmm. That's where Jews like to go for anything. Why not go for politics there too? Okay, and what do they find? Well, first of all, you can write off Republican Party. Um, the Republican Party, as we all know, uh, is not going to really come down in favor of the things that are concerned about Jews. I mean, for example, the Republican Party's position on affirmative action is deplorable. Its position on urban violence is, is, is I think, in many ways, indistinguishable from the Democratic Party. Look what happened with Rodney King uh, riots and things like that. Um, if when, when, when Jews were, were uh, being uh, uh, attacked in Crown Heights, uh, you know, where was the Republican Party? Uh, <clears throat> probably at the country club. Um, the more serious, however, more serious is when they go to <laughs> looking at conservative groups, and here I probably will get into trouble, um, or at least with some people, uh, and I've, I've, I've discussed this, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but it, it's inevitable that as soon as a Jew shows up looking around, you know, shopping for a new other, going to the singles bars and things like that, inevitably they will detect some odor of anti-Semitism in the, in, the, in the conservative right, okay? Now, that is historically exactly what they've been told. Any Jew who wants to read uh, History of the American Right, and I've certainly read a number of them, find it populated by anti-Semitic groups. I mean, those of you old enough to remember, I don't remember, but Gerald L. K. Smith and, and and uh, Father Coughlin and the, certainly the Klan and all kinds, you know, it's a disease, anti-Semitism is, along maybe perhaps with anti-Catholicism, is a disease of the right. Now, I, in the paper itself, I make all kinds of nuanced arguments, you know, some of this is defensible and, and there are legitimate uh, uh, gripes that could be had and, and I'm certainly not going to hold Jews up as a model minority who are blameless and in, 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 in many of the, of the calamities, political calamities, they have brought upon their own heads and I, I really don't want to discuss this in this type of, right now it's in the paper, but it, it's just too nuanced. But the bottom line is this, if the uh, 
views most of us represent on racial matters, and I, and I speak as, as, as you know as part of the of the of the uh, um, congregation here. If, if that view is to be advanced, and to be advanced successfully, okay, it means in some significant way that uh, Jews uh, will have to be brought on board. And if that is to transpire, there are certain aspects of the right that are half going to have to be dealt with. Now, I am not going to get into this discussion of selling out and, 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 and this, that, and everything else like that. This may indeed be a circle that cannot be squared. And in fact, I, I am not terribly optimistic about the thing. But nevertheless, okay, if one to uh, make this uh, change from your make these enemies your friends. And by the way, I should add, I didn't didn't say this. There are there's a very good article in this current issue of commentary. By the way, two very very good articles in this issue of commentary. One about the Austrian situation, uh, which will surprise you, coming out of commentary, uh, and the other one about called "Are Jews Going Rightward?" by a guy named Friedman. And it's an excellent article. It, is, it makes the point that Jews are ready to change. I mean, they've had enough with racial set-asides and all this kind of catering to, to, to the Al Sharptons. But right now, they are wandering around sort of homeless. They have no place to go. Uh, they cannot stomach going into the Republican Party. They are fed up, in many cases, the Democratic Party. They are there. To, to be picked up by something, and I would hope that they would be picked up by us. Okay, I think I've almost exhausted my time completely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weisberg, I, you know, I would admit and agree with you that even on the respectable right, uh, a group's much more mainstream than this uh, meeting today, uh, Jews would encounter traces of anti-Semitism, at least. But it's also true that a lot of what Jews who are not familiar with the rhetoric of the right or the thinking of the right, what they would think is anti-Semitism is not really, at least, serious anti-Semitism. I agree absolutely, and I've made your point on repeated occasions to people. I don't know how many times I've tried to... I, mean, I agree, okay. Yeah. And I've said with people, look at... Okay, in this context, okay, this is what this means, okay? It is not anti-Semitism, although it does sound suspiciously like Stalin's admonitions against ruthless cosmopolitans, etc. So, oh no, there is a real vocabulary, uh, a conceptual issue here in which often, and Jews are guilty of this too. I mean, they make these, you know, gratuitous remarks which they file, file find innocuous, okay, which others find frightening, and, and vice versa. Oh, absolutely. All right, so if Jews are going to come into any kind of right-wing movement or conservative movement, it, it's a two-way street, right? I mean, absolutely. I mean uh, Jews have to get over certain preconceptions, and, and just as maybe Gentiles have to get over Absolutely. Now, give me an example of that. I mean, I have, uh, to many Jewish friends, I have defended the Freedom Party, okay? And I, not completely, but I have said, look at, you know, you have to get beyond what this person said in some conversation to his mother uh, or some speech someplace. You have to look at this in terms of European politics and you have to look in terms of bureaucracies and, and things like that. Oh, I mean, we're on the same wavelength. Okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not handling the question, so. I think the, the, the easiest way to put anti-Semitism out of business in groups like this is for people like you to talk as frankly as you have. My question is, do you think it would be uh, helpful to talk to the larger Gentile and Jewish society the way you have? Yeah, I have tried this um, on, on, on occasion. It's, um, it's very, very difficult. Uh, we're talking about uh, centuries of baggage and uh, demonization on both sides, uh, a gratuitous vocabulary which only inflames, to get to, to, to your point. Uh, and I, I think, though, in the long run, it, it, it's something that I would like to see happen. I mean, I would like to see um, uh, 
all that energy currently directed towards uh, propping up this, this, this bogus sect uh, put on the other side. And my, my talk with, with, with Jews privately is that they really privately, many of them are on our side, they're afraid, how should we say it, to come out. And I have threatened many cases to, to have a magazine called Jewish Out, which will uh, <laughs> indicate that some well-known civil rights lawyers have been going around saying to their children, stay away from the Schwarze. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, question I have is this. I've met a lot of Jewish people at these conventions especially. Mm -hmm. haven't met a lot of them otherwise. But anyhow, how do things like aid to Israel get accounted for, which is excessive by any stretch of the imagination? Yeah. How do things like the demands that everybody apologize for and repay Jews for what happened to them during the Second World War? How do the things that are invoked against people, for example, like Haider, come in? Israel, of course, was behind that. It was people from Israel that started yeah, it, the Yeah, it's clamor. interesting. The two defenses of, of Haider that yeah. I have seen, let me, let me, I, what you say deserves hours of, of, I agree. of, of, mm -hmm. of, of, of serious discussion. I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. But let me point out that, that the two uh, pro Haider articles that I, not pro, but at least balanced articles I have seen of Haider, and, and, and there was a lot of pro stuff in them, okay. One appeared uh, about uh, a month ago in the Weekly Standard written by a woman named Applebaum. Okay, I assume that she's Jewish. And the other appeared, as I said before, in this most recent issue of Commentary. Okay? And that there are a lot of Jews out there who uh, do not take the party line, uh, which, you're, True, which, right. which you are, are, are saying. Okay? But as I have said, they have no place to go. Now, um, What's happening right now is, is that that rejection of the party line is being picked up by the Orthodox community. And I gather we have here some rather large rabbis in this community. Uh, um, uh, Rabbi Schiller I'm thinking about. But what happens is most Jews are highly secularized. Uh, they are reformed. They, they, they go to what is called a shul with a pool, the Jewish Community Center. Uh, and um, they, they are not ready to, uh, uh, to become Hasidim. And so they are really kind of a lost people. I, I mean, you're right, and, 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 but nobody has, has exploited this unease with, with those positions. Okay. Now, the only other thing I wanted to say was this. In addition to anti-Semitism, there's something called pro-Semitism. And it's participated in by Christians as well as Jews. Oh, it's, I told you, when I watched Absolutely. Pat Robertson, there it's like pro -Semitism a, I feel I'm well a fundraiser. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, that's, I just wanted yeah, to mention I mean, that. It it's is a seri that very serious more. what you say. It's just. This perhaps is not the place to, to do that. Uh, uh, the 2,000 years uh, worth of baggage that you talked about, the, the first two points, the Goyim will try to kill us, point two, they will fail. If, if this is being passed down from generation to generation, uh, and children, Jewish children are being taught this, how can they, expect it to, how can they uh, be expected to join White Christian organizations, uh, which are on the political right, the, the, the Goyim organizations, and really participate and feel not threatened if they feel that these white Christians are their ultimate enemy whose aim is to destroy them and that today they might be sitting Good talking question. about politics, yeah. smiling, and tomorrow they might be putting them on a train for... Right. right? I, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that is a... a let me just re answer that personally, okay? Um... Jews are a funny people. Um, uh, let me be a little personal here. Okay, I, I am divorced. I have a girlfriend. She is German, born and raised in Germany. Uh, not any of you know German. She's real German. She's a Brandenburger, uh, which is Berlin, east of Berlin. She's on the other side of the Odenesse. Okay, um, I visit. We go to Europe all the time. Uh, we spend all our summers there. Um, I, I spend a lot of time with her family. Uh, her father was in the German military, okay? Uh, I have no problem with her family. Uh, her aunt was in the Hitler Youth. Her aunt adores me. Uh, she thinks I'm wonderful, okay? Whenever I come, she gushes all over me, okay? And we have a wonderful time. She's in a nursing home, and she can't wait until I show up. Um, my, child, my, my son goes to Germany all the time. He speaks he's fluent in German. He's 18 years old. 
He's a Wagner Nietzsche fan. Uh, last time we went to Germany, we had to march to every Fakakta Nietzsche shrine in Germany, okay, and pay homage. Uh, we spent two days in Bayreuth, uh, going over the manuscripts in the in the, in the uh, and going to the field uh, the, the Festspiel. Um, ask how that happens, okay? And I, I yield to nobody in my and I, I I will never forget, okay? I am a hard liner, uh, yet yeah yeah. It happens, right? And stranger things have happened, right? I mean, everyone here has, knows these stories. So my feeling is, let's try to get over this. Let's not sit around trying to dissect this thing logically. Uh, you know, one of the jokes in the paper is, 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 is uh, what do you get when you, when you uh, uh, assemble the 10 greatest Wagnerian conductors in the world? What do you get? The answer is a minion. A minion is the, is the prayer group that you need for Jews to get the, to, you need 10 to prayer, okay? Every single performance of the ring I've ever gone to has been conducted by a Jew, okay? So uh, there's no question that Jews have nothing against high Goyim culture. In fact, we probably support it financially. Okay. Email, I don't know if you care to give it. Okay, the email is, uh, R W E I S S B E R Weiss Bay, that's my, my Arab name. Uh, at U I U C dot E D U. That's University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. So it's R W E I S S B E at U I U C dot E D U. I enjoy, I have lots of stuff, by the way. Jared didn't say, I'm a proficient humorist. I write stuff that I guarantee to make you incontinent. And if you're interested in becoming incontinent, it depends. Uh, <laughs> um, please feel free to uh, uh, contact me. I'll be more than happy uh, to get rid of the stuff that's piling up in the house. Okay, thank you very much.